The house has been one of the most mystical, unique experiences in a movie that I've had in a while. The stop motion in this movie is so cool, especially the first story. The designs are so unique and haunting. And the house is not a normal movie by any means. It's actually three different stories put together. Almost like you're watching three different episodes from a show, but it all happens to be in one movie and they're all interconnected in some way. Now, a lot of you might be confused as if you've seen this movie, you're probably just thinking, okay, I thought it was just three completely separate stories that all took place in the same house. And yeah, while that is true, there actually is a lot of underlying details that really interconnect these stories. These three intertwining stories have such good messages about life, relationships, people, and most importantly, the main message of this has to do with materialism and how terrible it can be. And we're not talking about just the basic idea of materialism. We're talking about completely different perspectives in each story of materialism. And where is material at its peak? A house. I mean, just think about it. Houses are literally the embodiment of materialism, or at least for some people. People overspend on houses all the time. They overstretch their finances just so they can impress their friends, their family, and just being able to brag about your wealth to everyone, even though in reality, you're just in extreme debt. I mean, we see this all the time. Back then, we had, you know, MTV cribs and stuff like that, where we idolized these people's ridiculous houses. And now we have the internet with a bunch of really young influencers becoming extremely rich at a very young age. And we have the get the bag culture to thank for all this shit. People just wasting their money on extreme ridiculous houses just so they can brag to everyone how much money they have. And that has literally become a huge culture with so many different internet personalities, especially TikTok being the biggest one. I mean, you can't even scroll through YouTube anymore without seeing a title that has some sort of amount of money on it, giving someone a blank amount of money, giving someone Teslas. Hey, look how much money I have. This movie came at such a perfect time because it shows everyone the real difference between a house and a home. And more importantly, the difference between the wealth when it comes to money and the wealth when it comes to happiness. I mean, we've all heard the classic phrase, money does not buy happiness. And I honestly don't like that phrase. I feel like it doesn't really do it justice because those people in the world who are the happiest are the ones who do have financial stability in their current situation. I feel like a better way to describe it is the richest man in the world is not the one who has the most but the one who needs the least. Are you guys tired of your only options for quick meals tends to be something frozen or fast food? Are you trying to make your gains? Maybe you're trying to lose weight or maybe you just want to eat healthier. But the problem is the time it takes to make a meal every single day just doesn't fit into your schedule. Well, Factor takes care of that. Now, I've actually been using Factor even before they ended up sponsoring me. I was a little bit skeptical at first about, you know, packaged meals being that good, but boy, was I wrong. Not gonna lie, some of the meals I've had are honestly better than meals that I've made at home. And on top of everything, they're dietitian approved, they're never frozen, and you get to choose the meals that you want. And also if you have maybe a specific diet, like keto, calorie smart, veggie, vegan, and they even have protein plus if you're making them gains. And not only that, but they have snacks, smoothies, and a bunch of other add-ons, even like breakfast stuff, like apple cinnamon pancakes, like who doesn't love that? All of this is cheaper than takeout. Personally, I always struggle around lunchtime for me to make a meal. I could always kind of make a dinner meal, but when it comes to lunch, I always like getting all my work done in the morning. So around lunchtime, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't really want to cook anything. So I always just end up grabbing a factor meal and eating that instead. And even my wife and son both love the factor meals as well. So it's really nice to have something super quick and easy and healthy every single day. If you guys want factor, head to factor75.com or use the link in the description, or you could use code BionicPig50 to get 50% off your first purchase of your factor box. Do it. You won't regret it. The first story we see in this movie, in my opinion, is definitely one of the most terrifying out of a trilogy. I feel like the reason for this is the style of animation they chose. This entire movie is stop motion, but the dolls that they use in the first story is so goddamn creepy. They're all just kind of balls of fluff. And with the really tiny faces on the big head, it's just creepy. But this story truly can relate to a lot of people because this story focuses on materialism byproduct of being shamed by your family. 
I'm sure a lot of us have been in a situation where your family kind of detests the life that you live because it isn't up to the financial standards that they believe that you should be at. And that is the case for Raymond. Raymond is the father of the family that the story follows. The setting of the story looks to be around the 1800s era. You're following this story through the eyes of Mabel, the young daughter of Raymond. We hear that there are people coming to visit their house and her father even mentions that these people are not nice people. And we soon find out that he's actually describing his own family. And we could see instantly that his family is quite wealthy, or at least that's how they perceive themselves by the way that they are dressed and how they present themselves. And the entire time that they're at the house, they're just scoffing at how poor the life that they're living is. They're even disappointed in the fact that Raymond had another daughter instead of a son. If you notice in this first story, everything that they're laughing at is something that has intrinsic value that is beyond a fiscal one. First of all, them getting upset about the daughter. That's literally life itself. A piece of furniture that was actually handed down by his father. The curtains that her mother made with her own hand. Everything that they are making fun of and laughing at happens to be something that is important to them, that has more value than money does. So like I said, the entire visit was spent bashing Raymond and his life and everything he is as a person. And at the end, they started comparing him to his father who was a drunk and gambled away all of his money. And this obviously cut pretty deep for Raymond as he starts to drink heavily and goes out for a walk into the woods. And all of a sudden, a carriage appears out of nowhere with nothing pulling it in the middle of the woods. Kinda creepy. The old man peeks out and beckons him in. And when he comes home, the first thing he does is exclaim that he is hungry and starts to scarf down food. Now, the first time watching this, I was kind of confused as to why this is happening. But thinking about the fact that this is set in the 1800s, a sign of wealth was obviously gluttony. I mean, you could even say that today as well. And not only that, he starts yelling at his wife to get him wine, that he needs wine. Again, something that shows wealth because wine is a very valuable drink. The next day, a man named Thomas comes to their house to discuss the agreement that Raymond had with a man named Mr. Von Schoenbeek, you know, the creepy old guy in the carriage. Apparently the deal here is that he wants to build them a house, a very fancy house, but the only condition is the fact that they have to live inside this house and leave everything behind. And something interesting is the fact that this man supposedly has no interest in money, but only loves the creative process of making a house. So obviously right away, we could see something's quite fishy here. Now, Raymond obviously pushes Penny to do this. And the way that he pushes her isn't saying that, oh, we could finally have, you know, a nicer house. His first thing he said is we'd be the envy for miles around because that's the thing he's concerned with. He's already bewitched by materialism. Now, I don't necessarily believe that Raymond is a bad guy, but he is blinded by what his family has said to him, how his family has shamed him. He wants to, in a way, get them back, and he feels like doing this is a way not only to get them back, but to finally receive their approval. When in reality, he should realize how flawed their way of life is and live happily with his family. But this unfortunately will lead to some horrific events inside the brand new house. The house gets completed rather quick and the whole family moves in. And Mabel seems to be the only one realizing something is off about this house. Noticing Thomas out of the corner of her eye panicking at times and even seeing a random man in a dark room with a saw. So right off the bat, we know that they're not alone in the house. From the moment her parents walk into the house, it seems like they are completely blind by the beauty of the house to even question what is going on. I did Mr. Von Schoen make a house for free? Why is there random dudes inside the house? Why are they not allowed to bring their old belongings into this house? However, Mabel starts to question literally everything. When they sit down to eat, she questions who made all this food, but her father doesn't even blink. He doesn't even think about it. They completely start neglecting not only Mabel, but their newborn child, Isabel. I feel like the reason that the children can easily see through the lies of the house is the fact that they symbolize innocence. Children are people who don't even understand the value of money or the purpose of money, which is something that is very common. People become so obsessed with just making the money and getting things that they neglect their children. They become workaholics. They work too much. They end up not spending much time with their family or their child. They end up wasting money on things that are just completely unnecessary. 
And I feel like the fact that Raymond's father turned out to be a drunk and a gambler also has to do with materialism. Because people with gambling addictions are people who are obsessed with things. They're obsessed with money. Because they believe that one day they'll finally hit that huge jackpot and everything will be fine. They'll be able to buy that new speedboat. People don't really think about how awful gambling addiction truly is. I feel like the fact that Raymond and Penny are starting to neglect their children is just showing how blind people become to things that are important in life just because of money and things. Now this next scene is where shit starts getting really creepy in the house. Penny starts to make curtains, but the way that she makes them, it almost seems like she's doing it as work rather than making something that truly matters to her like she did at her old house. And as Raymond tries to start the fire, it goes out and then we hear the echo of the ominous laughter as Mr. Von Schundbeek is sitting in the corner laughing at both Penny and Raymond. And the true horror of this house truly starts to be shown. The window that Mabel looked out of last night to see their old house has actually been built over. And when she looks out, she sees a tired man standing there with a saw. Not only that, but the stairs have been taken down as well. The house is changing. And Mabel starts to see more and more workers seemingly in a trance state. Even when she speaks to them, they just stare back at her without a word. She walks up to her father, who is laughing almost maniacally, while they tear down their old house. And her mother starts telling her that she has no time for them as she has a lot of work to do. And this work that she's doing is just making curtains for the house. And then once Mabel sees her parents in the garments that were gifted to them by Mr. Von Schoenbeek himself, she calls them foolish and how her parents respond is anger. And I feel like this is kind of a small nod to just fashion in general. A lot of times people end up looking completely foolish and dumb, but it doesn't matter because the brand name and the price tag on the items that they're wearing. Some people just don't give a shit how stupid it looks because of how expensive it is. People are just buying things because it's expensive, not because they actually like the thing. But that night, Isabel ends up leading Mabel down these hidden stairs to what seems to be their old house. And all of their old belongings were hidden there. Almost as if Mr. Schoenbeek was giving their family a chance to make the right choice before it's too late. And unfortunately for her parents, it was already too late. As the final nail in the coffin for them was Raymond finally understood what he must do to start the fire. Is burn all of their personal belongings of the old house, starting with his favorite chair. As for Mabel and Isabel, they started to head back only to find themselves completely lost in random hallways. And even whenever Mabel finds her father and starts yelling to him that she needs help, her father again is just blinded by this house and completely ignores them. And they run into Mr. Thomas and they find out that he was actually hired by Mr. Von Schoenbeek and he's just an actor that was fed lines. And then we see a giant Mr. Von Schoenbeek appear before him. God, he's so freaking creepy. Mabel and Isabel kind of walked around these hallways for a while and ended up giving up and fell asleep. Now they were in an empty corridor. However, when they woke up, Right next to them were their parents' room. However, her parents weren't there. But in the flames, she sees her favorite dollhouse being burned along with all the other precious things that they've had. And the dollhouse must have been the final piece to her parents' demise. As she hears her father's voice, but she doesn't see him. She turns to find that her father has been turned into a piece of furniture and her mother has been turned into a curtain. They both tell Mabel and Isabel to escape while they can and her mom uses the curtains in order to get them out of the window as the fire spreads throughout the room. Now I know a lot of you are probably wondering at this point, what the hell did I just watch? But I feel like everything is kind of connected to Mabel's dollhouse. Mr. Von Schoenbeek is just playing dollhouse with the family because at the end of the day, that's kind of what they were doing. None of the things in the house were theirs. It was all Mr. Von Schoenbeek's and they basically became Mr. Von Schoenbeek's puppet and being able to change everything so quickly that they don't even realize it as well. But burning the dollhouse, I feel like was the final thing that made them turn into furniture. I mean, sure, it's awful to burn all the personal possessions that they themselves had, but uprooting your entire family's life, moving and destroying all of the things of your old house, even your own daughter's dollhouse, all in the pursuit of material things. So they ended up becoming empty, turning into the very thing that they were obsessed with.
This one is set in a more modern time in the same house that we saw in the first one. I don't know if it's the exact same house or if it's built by Von Schoenbeek in a different location, but we're following a developer who has put pretty much his entire life into this house to flip and sell it. And we learn that the only reason he wants to flip and sell this house is so he can get a loan from the bank and buy a speedboat. At the start of the story, he's talking to someone named Derek and he's telling him how he had to let all of his construction crew go because he can't afford it. And we can instantly see why he can't afford the construction crew. As the items that he is buying for this house to flip it. He buys a fancy rotisserie oven and we also see on his laptop smart modern lighting, which we all know smart lighting is pretty much a gimmick. And before he's even sold this house, he's already calling his bank about the fact that he's about to sell this house in order to get a loan, just showing how impatient and greedy he is. And a little detail I didn't catch on my first watch through is in the background, the radio is on and we hear something interesting because they're actually talking about the economy and how it's the worst it's ever been. And right now they are considered to be in a recession. And we start to find out pretty quick that this developer is kind of delusional and living in a world of denial. Now the introduction to his denial comes from when we see a few bugs that crawled into a wall. And instead of realizing that he should probably call an exterminator to get rid of all the bugs before he starts putting all the different stuff in, he ends up just hiding it with plaster. Throughout this, you can find out that he's fixing a lot of symptoms, but he's not actually fixing the problem. So he ignores the bugs and spends all day putting in all these fancy new kitchen appliances and furnishing. And in the end, he was miraculously able to rush and put everything together emphasis on rush. And from what we can see, this does look modern as hell. Everything's fancy, bright white, and brand new. Again, a house with stuff in it. I remember one time when I was house hunting, I saw a house like this, where everything was very gimmicky, everything was very white, and nothing had character to it. It almost felt dead, like there was no soul. He ends up calling his partner in order to tell him the good news about the house. And unfortunately, he starts hearing scratching on the inside of the cabinets and lo and behold, a swarm of bugs come out. So instead of again, calling someone to handle the situation, he's in a hurry. He wants that speedboat. He just takes a bunch of boric acid, the powder, and just kind of spreads it everywhere. Even the article that was being read out loud was actually cut off right before it started talking about the larva because it was going to say the larva caused the most damage. You need to get rid of those. But instead, all he's doing is walking around with some boric acid powder and just throwing it everywhere, just trying to hurry up and get all this done. He calls his partner again, but this is interesting because every time he calls his partner, we do not hear the other voice on the line. And also it always seems like his partner doesn't really want to talk. Now at first I assumed it was just, oh, they're having an argument or they're having an issue, but you'll find out what's actually going on. Anyway, on the day of the showing, you can tell everything's kind of just off. The floor being a bright white carpet sure looks fancy and modern, but the developer didn't really think about how dirt would be showing. So everyone's dirty footprints are getting dragged all over this floor. And not only that, but curtain rods are falling over. The sink doesn't really work properly. And honestly, it seems like no one's interested in this house at all because everything in this house is just a gimmick. It's just fancy. It's overpriced just to be overpriced. He does a little monologue talking about the marble, the counter, the floors and the cabinets. We're all from different countries with very expensive, rare materials. The lights in the kitchen are all smart lights and change color. And of course, the rotisserie oven. And when he starts this speech, there's actually quite a lot of people in here, but at the end of the speech, everyone's gone. No one really cares. It's basically all the glitters are not gold because normal people don't care about needlessly expensive things. Because if the sink don't work, the curtain's falling down, there's a bug a problem, they're not gonna be interested. And after the last person finally leaves because of a malfunction with the lights, all of a sudden two people seemingly appear out of nowhere in front of them. A very slender tall woman and a wide set man and they both have very raspy voices. And they both mention that they are very, very interested in the house. And obviously the first thing I kind of noticed was the fact that they look exactly like the bugs that have been a problem in this house. And also the moment that they appear, we start kind of seeing bugs appear in the background here and there. And when he notices this, he does it again. He starts doing the boric acid powder, just throwing it everywhere. And we can really start to see that this stuff is messing with his head as how he kills this last bug. 
Now, these two people really start to overstay their welcome a bit too much as they mention that they want the house, but hasn't mentioned anything about buying the house, about finances, about how they will pay for it. But since this developer is literally desperate to find someone to just buy the house so he could finally get a speedboat, he actually allows them to stay the night in the house. He even starts hosting them as if they're in a hotel, getting them tea and different things. And of course, he gives a call to the bank and tells her that he has some buyers that are very interested and are going to buy. But again, They've never said anything about actual finances. Now, something interesting I want to mention about this room, it could be a coincidence, but I mean, honestly, I feel like everything in this movie has a meaning. This room is set up to look like there are two eyes in a mouth, almost as if the house is watching. Also, it's interesting that this house is on a road named Von Schoenbeek Lane. But in a frustration with these two people, he ends up calling his partner. And again, the person on the other line does not seem interested in talking at all. He falls to the floor in anger only to look up to find hundreds of roaches doing a nice little dance number for him. Now, this part really confused me at first. You know, why the hell are, are the roaches randomly dancing? I feel like this is a combination of this powder truly starting to mess with his head a lot. He's basically tripping out, but it also has to do with the bugs kind of taunting him, being like, yo, bitch, this is what happens when you don't take care of the real problem. His eagerness to get something that is completely out of his financial range has completely destroyed him mentally. And I feel like the fact that this is taking a mental toll, now sure it, it does have to do with the powder, but I feel like it's symbolic for the mental toll that people go through when they do things like this. When they become so obsessed with getting this crazy expensive item that it destroys them mentally. But I just wanna mention the animation of this part is really cool. I like the little dancing bugs. It honestly reminds me of the dancing mice and Coraline, which it could be a little bit of a reference there. So he finally decides to call the cops on these two people because they're basically squatting. The cops arrive, but it's not for the reason that he actually called. It was actually because of a complaint from his dentist. Who is his dentist, you ask? The person that he's been calling constantly, and he's been giving him names like Deer, Sweetheart, and even getting a little frisky with them. The dentist actually called the cops to tell him how inappropriate it is that he keeps doing this and calling him because they need a professional relationship as he's just his dentist. So this whole time, this person we believe to be his partner is just another one of his delusions. He's making up in his head that he has a relationship with someone instead of actually finding a relationship with someone. But after the officers tell him to stop calling his dentist, they leave and they ignore him about the two squatters at his house. And then those squatters end up inviting their entire family. Bit of rage, he takes this powder, this boric acid that he's been pouring all over the house and tries to open it in order to pour it over these humanoid bug creatures. But instead it ends up popping open and the powder just puffs in his face. He gets taken to the hospital and he is greeted with these two squatters to come pick him up and take him home. And the reason he was so willing to just get up and go with these two is not the fact that he gave up because that's what I thought actually happened. But what actually happened is he ingested all of this powder. It actually put him in a catatonic state, rendering him nearly brain dead or what we would like to call a real rat. Because at the end of this episode, it's quite disturbing as all of these creatures, which we know by now are just large representation of roaches, just start ripping up the house. And it ends with the developer coming through the hole of the rotisserie oven. The one thing that he bragged about the most, that he talked up the most to all of the customers, but now it's just a piece of garbage that he dug a hole through as he has become the vermin that destroyed this house. So I guess the question is, is who the hell are these people? You know, are, are they real? Well, I believe that these roach people are real to an extent, but I feel like it does have to do a lot with the powder and it messing with his brain. I feel like he kind of made up these humanoid bugs. Full delusion that someone was going to be interested in this house. He basically convinced himself before anyone was even interested in the house that someone was going to be interested. Or, you know, it could also just be real and Von Schoenbeek is some, doing some weird magic shit. This last one might be my favorite. Now, it could just be because it has a happy ending and kind of 
everything comes full circle with this story. We start the story in an area that is completely flooded except for this one house. Now the house has been converted into an apartment building and we see the owner Rosa with a restoration plan for her build. And I just want to mention how satisfying the layout is of her plan and just the stop motion little paper. It, it's just eye candy. I love it. So we see her spend a long time putting up a bunch of wallpaper for it to only fall to the ground. And the reason this wallpaper didn't work is the fact that the water she was using was brown water. And this is kind of just a nod to the last story where instead of her just fixing the plumbing, she ends up deciding to just focus on putting up the wallpaper instead. And as she walks around the house, there's even messed up floorboards. So there are a lot of problems with the actual house itself, but she's focusing on just putting up colorful wallpaper. So she goes around the apartment and we meet Elias. And at first glance, Elias kind of seems like a classic, just bad tenant. He hasn't paid rent for 12 whole weeks and he was complaining about the brown water, which the brown water is actually a reoccurring thing throughout this because both tenants in this are complaining about the brown water all the time. But Elias ends up offering her fish to eat rather than rent. And obviously she gets angry and tells him to get her her rent. Then she goes to her next tenant, Jen, who seems to be very in touch with nature and her spiritual side. And she asks Jen for rent only to receive an obsidian crystal. And again, Jen seems to be a bad tenant but then you think back to the main situation of the story. They're in the middle of nowhere. They're in the middle of a flood. They look like they are the last house in this entire city because all we see is fog in the distance. We don't know how far out this flood is. Is the entire world flooded? Is just this town flooded? We don't necessarily know. But the main thing is, is the fact that it's ridiculous for Rosa to be focusing on renovating this house and asking for rent money when that just doesn't matter anymore. Elias was actually just offering her fish because he's the one who goes out and gets food for all of them. And he was worried about her help because she hasn't been eating. And when Jen offered her obsidian, she told her it was so she could find her true self. But all Rosa seems to be obsessed with right now is money, where in this situation, money means nothing. I mean, they're in a situation where the only thing that matters right now is just survival and finding happiness because she talks about the reason she needs money. She needs money so she could fix the plumbing. She needs money so she could fix the floorboard. But that doesn't make any sense because what is she going to buy with this money? She could learn how to fix the plumbing herself or learn how to fix the floorboards herself, but she thinks that money is the thing that's going to fix it, but that's just not right. A man named Cosmos, who is Jen's spiritual partner, appears, and at first he does kind of just seem like over-the-top, annoying, pretentious hippie. And I feel like Rosa and Cosmos are supposed to be the complete polar opposite. One believes that money and material is the prime source of all that is good, while Cosmos believes that it is the wanderlust life, you know, living off the grid. Money is just a concept, being one with nature and all that stuff. Rose is obviously quite annoyed with Cosmos at first until he mentions that he's very handy and he could help her fix things around the house. But then he says a line that truly encapsulates this entire movie. You must begin with the roots. The first, second, and third story all connect with this line, as Raymond and the developer neither focused on the roots. They tried to cut corners and go the easy route, all blinded by material, when instead they should have focused on the roots, which in Raymond's case would be his children, the people that truly mattered, the people that made him rich and happy. And the developer, he didn't focus on the roots of the house, he didn't focus on the roots of his own life, his financial delusions, his relationship with his dentist, all of them became obsessed with materials and weren't focusing on what truly matters. And the last story, of course, is Rosa. She's just completely ignoring the root of the problem, which would be the freaking flood. Money doesn't matter anymore. Money is non-existent. All that matters right now is survival and more importantly, relationship. Because Rosa keeps talking about new tenants coming in. She wants to get new tenants to come in so she can make more money in order to fix the house. And she keeps the relationship with Elias and Jen at arm's length. She keeps the landlord and tenant relationship. She never breached that line because all she's thinking about is money. Fixing up a house that is just doomed to fail. And while Rosa is speaking to Cosmos about the house, I believe Cosmo is more speaking of Rosa herself and how she needs to awaken and realize what's happening around her. The, the next day, Cosmos ends up ripping up a bunch of floorboards in order to make a boat for Elias. And Rosa obviously gets extremely pissed off. Elias tells her how it's completely pointless to stay at this house and try to fix it up when eventually everything's going to fall to the flood. This house is holding her back from happiness, from true friendship. We keep seeing shots of her looking out to them as both Elias and Jen are laughing with each other, having fun with each other. And now Jen, Elias, and Cosmos 
are all having a bond together, laughing together, while Rosa is all focused on the house. But apparently Cosmos did end up fixing the brown water and she notices that and spends her time putting that wallpaper up. But that time spent putting that wallpaper up, Elias ends up leaving without even saying goodbye. And you could really start seeing the internal struggle with Rosa. She's honestly struggling against this house almost as if this house has hypnotized her as the other two stories beforehand. But so far, she's the one who's truly trying to break out of this. She goes upstairs to find that Elias has left her two presents, one being a fish and the other being art that he drew of her. And apparently she's been so obsessed with the house, she didn't even know that Elias could draw. She didn't spend enough time with Elias to make a connection with them to even realize that. Then comes up to offer Rosa a final meal with her before both she and Cosmos leave. Then after Jen starts asking her questions about what she wants to do with her life, Rosa is still stuck on the house. And then we get to see this next sequence and I love this next sequence. A bunch of fog ends up coming through the door and Rosa starts to see stuff in this fog, her restoration collapsing before her eyes and, and seeing Elias and Jen again on the couch laughing but all of a sudden she sees herself on the couch laughing with them and then both of them are gone as she's sitting on the couch by herself. She's seeing what was, what could have been, and what is eventually going to happen if she keeps down this path. I feel like this was Jen and Cosmos trying to tell her that this restoration plan of hers doesn't matter anymore and she needs to move on. When everyone leaves, she's just gonna be alone. All that's left is a relationship between a house and her. You can't have a relationship with a material thing. The relationship that you get between a house and you is nothing compared to a bond that you get with an actual person. Either cherish the past that she had with Elias and Jen and move onward with the relationship she's been blind to for years, or she can stay with this house, a material, a building, and remain alone and filled with the delusion of renovating this house, destined for this house to just fall to the water. As she sees Cosmo and Jen leave, she turns to the house and basically begs the house to just let her go. She realized she's been missing out on all of these opportunities for friendships and happiness, all because of this house. But Cosmos ended up giving her a decision. He told her to push this giant metal lever whenever she's ready to move on. And once she finally pushes this lever, the house that she wanted to renovate ends up turning into a boat. And she ends up catching up not only to Jen and Cosmos, but Elias as well. I love this last story so much because like I said before, it truly finishes the circle of this story. But I feel like the first two stories were cautionary tales, a warning showing you things that could happen if you fall under the spell of materialism. However, this last one shows Rosa moving on and realizing what's truly important in life. It did take a situation where money completely doesn't matter in that universe. However, she was able to break free. One phrase that can completely summarize this movie, a home is a place that you can never feel alone, but a house is just a collection of bricks which actually are the lyrics to the song that plays during the credits of this movie. This movie is absolutely brilliant. It's a story of the pursuit of happiness and how we may never get everything we want in the world, but that truly doesn't matter. We may find ourselves blinded and consumed by the pursuit of wealth or what we would call in the world today, getting the bag, but the true importance of life is with the people we choose to share it with. In the world that we live in, materialism tends to overshadow what truly matters in the world. I know a lot of you out there get influencers shoved in your face, constantly flexing what they make, how much money they have, flaunting the things that they buy. And I'm sure it doesn't make you feel good either, but all of that is truly worth nothing because what truly matters at the end of the day is happiness. I hope you all have a good day.